All right. And then I am going to turn it over to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I'm going to give you control right now. All right, so you should have control. You can unmute your microphone. Thank you. I lost my little mute icon. Uh, everybody can hear me okay now, I'm assuming. Uh, thanks so much for, yeah. for giving your time today. We're gonna, we have a lot of material to get through, so let's get going. Um, the fact that this is um, workshop, virtual workshop is happening on the anniversary of Katrina is not lost on us. Um, this is, uh, hurricane season is something we have to take seriously here at Xavier, and so I'm really grateful that so many of you all are doing this today so you can take this information back to your own departments and, and your own divisions. Um, <clears throat> so, oh shoot, sorry. Here we go. <clears throat> so, the threat of a, a disruption is real in the university life. If you think about the disruptions we've had for hurricanes in the past, but even more recently, for uh, we've had classes canceled for rain and for ice, ice and snow. Um, this is something that we do have to we do have to take um, seriously. Oh, Jess, what happened? It looks like we. I don't know. I didn't touch okay. anything. All right, let me get us back. <laughs> okay, while you're Wait doing that, yeah, while you're doing that, sorry about that. Um, part of our, in CAT, we also try to role model things for all the times that you can see, that you can use, and so we are trying to role model. This is how you can uh, demonstrate how you use the Zoom meeting. Now, I didn't touch anything, though, so that's... Okay, try it again. Okay. You're not on the enter key or anything? No. Okay. But it. Yeah, it's. Are huh. you moving back? I'm not doing. Yeah, I'm not doing anything. It's just moving. Hmm. You want me to oh. move the screens for you? Uh, yes, I do. See, look, now it's doing that. Mm -hmm. I do. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> and so, do you hear that? It's like a, it's like something sitting on it, but it's not. See? I am not either. Weird. But do you hear the little bump? The little... All right. Did we get okay. past this? Okay, yeah, they, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, talk about disaster. Okay, so uh, disruptions do happen, and we do have to deal with them. We've had to deal with them here at Xavier, um, but I want to say that this workshop, I think, is helpful beyond just having a disaster that would close the new university for all. Um, it's also could be useful for um, if you have a family emergency or you have a me medical or personal emergency. I think it's uh, important for that, too. Okay, so next slide. Um, so not only uh, for natural disasters, but the CDC actually a few years ago came out with, um, with recommendations about learning how to do social distance teaching um, in, uh, when, the, when the flu epidemic was really bad and in anticipation of other kind of like infectious disease outbreaks. And so the CDC has even said to higher education teachers, let's think about ways to deal with this in advance. All right, next slide, Janice, thank you. Um, and so what is social distance teaching uh, that the CDC is talking about? This is just a model of teaching where you don't meet face-to-face. -face. Okay, so it's not just online teaching, but it's a model of teaching where you don't meet face-to-face. -face. This can accommodate, of course, uh, school disruptions or school closures, but also, like I said, um, infectious disease outbreaks and that sort of thing. But the key goal of social distance teaching is to deliver essential courses and essential content um, in a meaningful and useful way by having continuity of instruction. So what happens is as you are in your face-to-face -face class and then something happens, you need to shift to a social distance mode, you can do that and have continuity of instruction. Thanks. So what is? Uh, continuity of instruction. Um, this is just the process of maintaining the continuity of your teaching and learning in any situation, okay, in a crisis situation if the university closes. And so what we're going to talk about today 
is your instructional continuity plan. Um, and your plan should describe how you might carry on teaching and learning during the disruption. Again, meeting your objectives and doing what you need to do. Um, how would you ensure that students keep on track, maintain this learning? Um, and again, like I said, the plan does not solely focus on having this big disaster, but in any kind of disruption, how would you do this? So I think, I think we have time for a poll here. Oh no, benefits, benefits of instructional continuity. Um, it's a benefit to students and to faculty. Um, students, obviously, they get to maintain their learning. They have some consistency in, in their learning. Um, it helps them, if, in case of a big uh, disruption, it helps them keep, stay in track for graduation. Um, for faculty, it really can help us remain on track for delivering courses. If we all had this plan during the ice storm last, last spring, then we wouldn't have had to make up some of the courses we did on, on um, quiet days or Saturdays or this sort of thing. Um, and it can, it all can also help to faculty control over curriculum because we have a plan in advance for our courses and there won't be one coming down on high. Um, the instru instructional continuity plans can benefit faculty and students even during the normal semester. So I'm just going to say that any, any energy or planning you put into this now can actually pay off in the long term because even if, even if a disruption doesn't happen, because it can really give you kind of a renewed focus on what are your essentials, what are your essential learning objectives, what are your essential um, learning activities, and help uh, focus that in all circumstances. Now a poll, now a poll. Do you have an instructional continuity plan? Janice, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the poll. All right, and so everybody on your screen, you should uh, have a window that popped up where you can actually answer this question. Do you have an instructional continuity plan? Yes. All right, it looks like everybody may have taken the poll. So I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and we'll look at the results. Elizabeth? Good. Um, so, okay, good. So we've got a nice mix here. We've got people who already have a plan uh, and then people who don't have one at all or just starting the planning process. So for those of, of you who have a plan for all of your courses, feel free to jump in at any time, uh, contribute to what's been your successes and what's worked with, worked with you. And for those of you who don't or just starting, I think you'll find this uh, useful as we move forward. And we're also modeling here that you can embed polls and things into your um, Zoom activity, a Zoom session if you ever need to do one of these. Thanks, Janice. All right. So, before we get into the weeds on, uh, on what you can do and how you make a plan, I just want to ha have you think about three general tips getting started. Okay, so keep these in mind with what we're gonna say moving forward. One is start planning early. Um, yeah, we're, we're in the middle of hurricane season right now in the peak of it actually, and so we might not be as early planning for that, but again, having our plan now is gonna help us down the road, so let's just get start planning uh, and start planning early. Um, other thing is keep it simple. As you're designing your plan, don't try to do everything all at once. You can design your plan now, keep it simple so that you can follow it and students can follow it, um, and then you can add to it and revise it as you go along. And the third thing is know your technical skills. Start, because technology is involved in social distance uh, teaching, and so start with the technology you're familiar with. If you try to, and those two go together, if you try to buy it off more than you can chew in terms of technology, then it's gonna be a lot of a stressful situation for you and your students. So you wanna start out with what you're familiar with, and then build, you want to build on that. Thanks. 
Also, uh, in CAT, we want to emphasize, um, start with your objectives in mind, and then think about, think about you, you know what your course objectives are, so start with those objectives in mind, and then think about what kind of plan do you want to build to meet those objectives through your learning activities, through your assessments. Okay. Okay, so the components of an instructional continuity plan. Um, the four main components we're going to uh, unpack a little bit are course communication, how are you going to actually reach your students, the course materials, what do they need to be able to continue their learning, the student learning activities, what are the activities you would have done face-to-face -to, -face to enhance that learning and how can you carry those on, and then assignments and assessments, what are they going to be graded on in, in, if there's a disruption and you move to social teaching social distance teaching. So start with course communications. Um, the first thing you can do as you're, as, as you're building your plan is gather student emergency contact information. Um, we have a lot of this in, in EAB now that we can access through EAB, but um, you want to be sure that you have a way to get in touch with your students in case there's a disruption. And then you want to be sure that you can disseminate your contact information to your students. So if they can't get in touch with you through your, through, um, if you can't come to campus, you know, if you know that there's going to be a disruption, you can pay, pay for it, you could put a voicemail on your phone saying, here's how you reach me, or something like that. But students are, if, if you all cannot connect, then this plan can't take off. And then also establish a preferred method of communication with your students, um, whether that's going to be through email, through text, through, um, however you want to do it, whatever your preferred method of communication is going to be. And then it's really helpful to set policies or set expectations for what's your turnaround time and responses for responses going to be. And we start with commu uh, communication and sharing this information because if you cannot get in touch with your students, then the rest of your plan is a bit useless. So next, course materials. What are the materials that students will need to be able to access in order to continue their learning? Um, and this might be um, um, readings or videos or whatever materials you're using in your class. Um, if it's not uh, uh, hard copies that they would have with them, then you need to decide how to make these materials available to students. And of course, we can do this through Brightspace. And CAT offers a lot of Brightspace training, but you can post everything there, and that might be where they go. You can set it up as um, through a shared Google Drive or Google Docs, Dropbox. There are other uh, ways to do this, but this is sharing, sharing the materials. And then the student learning activities. We need to think about how could you continue class activities? What could students do in lieu of what they're doing in class? Is there a way is it for class discussions? Can you set up discussion boards in Brightspace? Um, for active learning um, activities, could you form groups and have them do active learning that then they report on in class? Um, online labs. Those sort of things. What are the, again, it would all depend on your course and your objectives. What are the essentials, essential learning activities? And then we'll brainstorm ways to continue those. And then assignments and assessments. Um, when you're cr uh, creating your plan, you need to review what are the assignments, the assessments, um, where are the grades coming from? And then how are you, what's the backup plan going to be um, for these? these grades for this grading scheme if you can't deliver it face-to-face -face the way you thought you would. So uh, with that, <laughs> let's uh, get in deeper on the plan. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you. I'll take it from here. All right, and as Elizabeth said, uh, it's definitely um, the ideal to be prepared and to plan. And so how can you prepare um, you yourself has to be, uh, have to be prepared. Uh, you should also consider continuity plan strategies. Choose a strategy. You're going to prepare your resources as well as your students, and then you need to practice your plan. And we'll get uh, more involved in each of these six here as we go forward. So to prepare yourself, instructional continuity workshops such as this one would be helpful 
as Elizabeth already mentioned, Brightspace workshops, because uh, with social, social distance teaching, technology is going to have to be involved. And so we have Brightspace workshops there uh, or other technology related workshops that uh, you might be able to uh, attend technical assistance, pedagogical assistance, and then what, what, what are your peers doing? What are others in your uh, department um, doing uh, in their instructional continuity planning? Perhaps that might be something that uh, you could utilize as well. And some questions to consider. I've got 11 of these. Um, what are your teaching and learning objectives? How will you communicate with your students? What do you want to communicate to the students? You need to know if your students have internet access. Um, how are you going to develop and or make your course content available? Do you have content that is readily available that you can upload into, say, Brightspace? How will you assess your students? Or uh, are there OERs available that perhaps you could use? Does the current textbook have online resources or a course cartridge available that might be helpful? Um, does the course require access to software that's only available on campus? Um, what accommodations are you going to make for students with disabilities? Now, I've listed these 11, and I'm interested to know what other questions do you, would you have? And I'm going to post these 11 in the chat as well as go back to the slide so you can see it. All right, so I posted the 11 questions in the chat. Anybody, what other questions other than these do you think you would, things that you would need to consider? Anyone? <coughs> any, any volunteer? <coughs> No other question? You can either say it out loud or type it in the chat if you prefer. Oh, you can hear us? And, uh, and Dr. Sal, would you mute your microphone? I saw you just joined us. Thanks for joining us. Would you, unless, you want to talk, will you, unless you want to talk, will you mute it? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Oh, great. I didn't realize it. <laughs> hey. OK. Um, I've got more of a follow-up question, but uh, what if internet is not uh, uh, readily or reliably available? Uh, is that just the end of the, uh, the, end of the plan? <laughs> that, is, that is definitely something that you need to consider. Um, if internet is not going to be available, then what would you or what would the students uh, do? Yeah. I know um, what was shared before in uh, one of these workshops that we did was that uh, if you don't have internet access yourself, perhaps you could, uh, in the area that you're in, there might be internet access, say, at a public library or something like that. So you could uh, perhaps get access to internet there. But yes, that is something that needs to be considered in your plan. Mm -hmm. um, what happens if I don't have internet access or the students don't have internet access, what am I going to do? Uh, Miriam has shared in the chat that uh, coordination with colleagues for coordinated courses is also yes. an important question for those very, folks. Yes, very, very important. Thank you. Voice of the chat. All right. Any others before we move on? Okay. All right, so some potential continuity plan strategies. If uh, the interruption is um, of a short duration, perhaps you can just extend the due date window or reschedule the assignment or the assessment. Um, you could also, for adapting assignments and assessments, um, if you're collecting uh, papers in class, for example, you could use email um, or perhaps use the learning management system, which is great for um, collecting assignments, or if you're more familiar with Google Docs or Dropbox, you could set that up. Um, discussion boards and or voice threads for discussions. So if the discussion um, needs to be more text-based, 
perhaps a discussion forum would work. But um, if you uh, wanted to have the students uh, perhaps respond using their voice or um, video, then perhaps a voice thread might be something that would work for what you're trying to do. You can also upload tests and quizzes into Brightspace, and there may be some publisher content. I see some information in the chat. Is there something we need to? I went to coffee shops for class to use their internet. Great. All right. Um, also, other potential continuity mm -hmm. plan strategies. You can uh, record your lecture in chunks and upload that to YouTube by us being a Google School or G Suite. We have access to YouTube, so you can record uh, lectures and upload there. Uh, if you're not familiar here in CAT, we do have a Camtasia studio that you could use. You can just um, schedule some time in the Camtasia studio and come over and record lectures. If you want to do that, just schedule that through uh, BART. Also in Brightspace, there's something called video notes. So you could actually, if you have a webcam on your computer, you can actually record a video note and um, put it directly into your course. Uh, meet virtually. Um, with virtual classroom or virtual office hours and in Brightspace integrated in there is UCU, um, which would allow you to do that. And, but if you're uh, more familiar with other web conferencing like Skype, Google Hangouts, Zoom, or FaceTime, perhaps that is something that you could use. And we purposely chose Zoom here today so that you can actually see how you might be able to conduct the session. Um, uh, another strategy would be a flipped classroom approach. And so in the, with the flipped classroom approach, you're asking the students to do something outside of class. And then in class, what would normally have been homework, you'd be taking care of that in class. So if you're using this flipped classroom approach, you're already giving the students things to do outside of class. And that in-class portion could be, uh, for example, in a virtual classroom. Um, you might have some combination of all of these as a part of your continuity plan strategy. All right, and so once you've uh, looked at the different strategies, then choose the strategies that's going to work for your course and what works for one course may not work for another. So examine your learning and assessment activities consider what can translate easier, easily into another resource. So for example, for submitting documents, as I mentioned, Brightspace, for example, has assignment submission folders, so that uh, could be an easy way to get the submission of documents from the students. With discussions, as I mentioned, you could have a forum or you perhaps could have a voice thread. So if you needed the discussion to be more tech, didn't mind it being more text-based, perhaps a discussion forum, would work, but if you needed uh, the students really to have voice, then um, perhaps voice thread. Um, so as you're looking at these, uh, consider what needs to be reworked or rescheduled in your continuity plan strategy. And so this is my uh, e-learning technology compass. And so if, as you're looking at the goals and the competencies that you need, those assessments that uh, would take place to determine that, um, and as we mentioned, with uh, social distance teaching, you're going to have to use some technology as a part of your, um, your plan. And perhaps everything that you need to do, you might be able to accomplish inside of Brightspace, or maybe one of these other tools might um, assist you. But uh, as I mentioned, like I said, you're going to have to, with social distance teaching, uh, technology is going to be involved. So you'll need to determine which tool might work best for what you're trying to do. Yeah, hey Janice, may I jump in one thing right here? Oh, actually, this slide is fine too. Um, that's one one thing that that um, you know those of you who are concerned about this, which is why you're attending today. It's another reason to really try to use Brightspace and get to know it. Um, I, I got to pilot it, so this is my third semester using it, and it's going so much more smoothly now. Than it, than, it did, than it did, it's just getting used to that technology. So I think the more you use it, even when you're having your face-to-face -face class, the more comfortable you get using it, then the better off you'll be if something happens, it comes time, or okay, now we're having to do everything, everything through it. 
That's great, an excellent point. All right, and so as I mentioned um, about Brightspace and uh, using a tool, uh, this is information from a 2016 Fusion Conference session um, on communications tools inside of Brightspace. And we're going to make all these materials that you're looking at today um, available to you. Uh, but this presenter um, looked at all of the various tools that you can communicate with in Brightspace and indicated uh, whether it was a formal or informal kind of tool, some examples of things that you could do with that tool, and then the effort that it would take um, to do that. And there's two pages of this. Um, and so here's the second page. As I was looking at this, um, on her suggestion here for the content tool, um, she calls it formal and says this is for course materials, learning activities, and assessments, but the effort is high. I wouldn't say the effort is necessarily high just to upload course materials and create modules to put them in. So I probably would have ranked this maybe medium to high. So don't let this scare you off. Um, also, Sue France, who's come to the university um, a few times for workshops for us, um, all, you know, talks about technology. She actually uses a lot of technology and she has uh, this handout um, available, so, uh, and it's organized by type. So, for example, if you're looking for something that is uh, available on for a mobile device, then perhaps one of these might help. Or if you want to do some screen casting, she's got some suggestions here. And she's at suefrance.com. So, uh, as I mentioned, we'll have these resources that we're talking about available that you could uh, link back to. Back in 2013, BART did a workshop on 50 web tools in 50 minutes. And so there's a list of web tools that he um, provided, and some of those might be of uh, benefit to you. Uh, so you can take a look at that. And I do want to stop and, um, for a moment and talk about the cat food blog. I would hope that everybody that is attending this session today is at least aware that there's a cat food blog and hopefully everybody has subscribed to it. Um, we do, we and CAT post things um, uh, routinely to the CAT food blog and I actually uh, provide Brightspace tips. So there's a whole section on um, Brightspace. And so if you subscribe, you'll get an email only when new content has been added uh, to the blog. So. I suggest if you're not already subscribed to go ahead and subscribe to the blog. And, and I put the link to the blog in the chat so you can go back up and see that and click right on that if you want to. Um, or when we're over, you can do it. And then you can see right there in the upper left-hand corner where it says subscribe, you just click on it. It's as easy as that. I'm really gonna encourage you to do it because the Brightspace tips um, that are coming through are, are just kind of crucial and well-timed. And so many of the questions we get have been answered in the blog. So <laughs> just do it. Thank you. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. And so for these web tool, uh, if you decide that you want to use a web tool and you're using Brightspace, you can um, embed the web tool inside of Brightspace so the student doesn't have to actually exit Brightspace necessarily to get to it. You can put a link to it. And here on the cat food blog was a tip I did back on in July about using the HTML editor. People hear HTML and they want to run for the hills. And notice here I say, don't let the name fool you. You don't have to know anything about HTML in order to use it because it, there is a toolbar that's much like using a word processor to uh, insert things into the, I'll call it the content editor. And there's one uh, button on there called insert stuff. And from there, you can actually insert uh, eight, uh, embed codes to web two old tools that are outside of, um, to link the things outside of Brightspace. So check that out. I also have this um, example here. It was done by someone um, equating various tools with Bloom's taxonomy. So if you knew that you needed to have something um, you were trying to do uh, the creating level here on Bloom's taxonomy. So here are some various tools 
that um, you might be able to use or if it was something related to evaluation and these are some tools. So uh, like I said, we'll have links to this information um, as well. And also, as Elizabeth mentioned, there are virtual laboratories um, out there. So perhaps that might be, uh, there might be a virtual lab that you might be able to use as a part of your instructional continuity plan. All right, and so once you've done that, you need to prepare your resources. So you need to set up your emergency measures in advance. Um, for some people who might, uh, so Elizabeth mentioned you need to start with what you know or where you are right now. And that may be that you're not very comfortable with technology. And so perhaps you could use Xavier's voicemail system just to be able to leave your students messages if that's where you are. Um, we hope to get you past that, but if that's where you are, that is an option. Um, prepare any alternate technology resource and then load up whatever necessary files. Search for OERs. Maybe there's some open educational resources that are available that you could use. If you're using a textbook publisher, he might, there may have some course materials. But with all of this, design it with accessibility in mind. So if you design right now, taking into consideration uh, accessibility needs, uh, later on, if you're using those same resources, then you've already taken that into consideration and you're already um, ahead of the game. And you definitely need to prepare your students. So you need to ask your students, do they own or have access to a computer? Um, do they own or have access to any software that's being used in the class? Do they have a cell phone? Do they have to pay for text messages? All of that's um, important. And then that continuity plan should be discussed with students on the first day of class. We're past that, but it's not too late. Uh, set the expectations, include that plan in your syllabus, and you may even want to have an in case of emergency handout available for the students. And by all means, practice your plan before an emergency strikes. So deliver a class using that plan to see what's worked, uh, what works. And that should be something that is announced as well as unannounced because you want to know what's working and be prepared to adjust your plan. So regardless of how simple that technology might be, if you and the students don't use it before, whatever interruption it might be, you might find it difficult to use during the disruption. So practice, practice, practice is very important. And uh, Georgetown University asked uh, faculty there to uh, provide, you know, if they had a situation where they had to um, have an alternate plan because something happened um, and they couldn't conduct class, you know, what kinds of things did, were they able to do? And uh, notice here, this person indicated that they were able to use Zoom to continue the class. And there were some other stories like this person uh, was able to continue with Skype. Somebody was stranded by volcanic ash cloud and they were able to use video conferencing. This person here was able to use, make the most of class time. It almost seems like a flip situation because they were able to create uh, podcasts. And I'm just curious, anybody uh, want to share something that they have done um, uh, when there was an interruption? and how you got past that. Is there anybody that wants to share a, a story? Anyone, unmute your mic and talk to me. No? Nobody. Are you all still there? Okay. I was about to add, uh, uh, in chat, that uh, she's lecture chat, lecture, lecture chat. Yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah, we. Uh, I use lecture capture because you know uh, that had been recorded in the previous semester, so uh, oh. that I was able to like retrieve the uh, those archives and post them. Um, huh. That can be a way, but sometimes because their <laughs> lectures are not recorded, so. We try not to like uh, completely rely on it. 
Mm -hmm. Also, I used like uh, the time we were uh, we use Blackboard. Uh, I was able to like post some activities and ask them to work in their groups. And the students uh, work. Uh, I think m most of them worked using uh, Google Doc to oh. finalize their group work. But I think it's a it work for group work because we do not have that many groups. But if it's individual work, I'm not quite sure. Okay, great. All right, lecture capture and uh, utilizing uh, Google Docs for group works. That sounds um, excellent. I see some Dr. Helm from my online class. I use Screencast-O-Matic free software to make the videos with the PowerPoint. Yeah, that's great. It's it. Uh, that's an excellent use of Screencast-O-Matic for for uh, screencasting, um, which uh, helps with that continuity plan. All right, anyone else want to share? Um, if you've got a writing assignment that's kind of been ongoing, uh, you can kind of switch over to do kind of some kind of online uh, uh, peer review, uh, either in Brightspace and Turnitin or uh, Google Docs makes that possible as well. Okay, great. All right, so we've got some ideas about peer reviewing and uh, using Google Docs and Brightspace. Okay. All right. And uh, anyone else? One more? All right. Okay. And uh, let's go move on. All right, and so I started out with these six and I just want to reiterate. Uh, so to be prepared, you need to prepare yourself. Consider your continuity plan strategies, choose that strategy, prepare your resources, as well as your students, and practice the plan. Um, because it's not a matter of if, but when some sort of interruption is going to happen. And so having that uh, instructional continuity plan will assist in a smooth transition past that. And as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, these tips to get us started, start planning early, keep it simple, um, and then know your technical skills. So start with technology that you're familiar with, and then you can build on this plan as you go along. Remember, using technology well is about using it with intention. So as you're selecting the technology that you want to use, you need to have some intention with it. Um, I think that speaks for itself. All right, and remind yourself that your plan will not be perfect. Do your best and be prepared to tweak that plan. Help is definitely available. I'm available for Brightspace training. We are having various workshops. Um, but if you need to schedule an appointment to meet with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can do that directly on my Google Calendar. Not only am I available, but uh, the entire CAT plus FD staff, faculty and staff are available um, and would be more than happy to assist you with any of your uh, needs uh, related to this. And we are working on um, updating our uh, resource for the instructional continuity planning. Uh, which is where the uh, recording and these slides will actually be. But in the meantime, I do have a quick start guide. I'm going to place this in the a link to this in the chat. All right, and so in the chat, you should see a link to a two page quick start guide. Um, that you can utilize. And like I said, uh, we will be, uh, we're in the process of updating our uh, instructional continuity planning resource. Um, and when that is available, I'll be posting some information about it and the link to it on the Cat Food blog. So another plug for subscribing to the Cat Food blog. Uh, you'll get that information from there. And I always like to end with practical applications for teaching and learning. So how does this apply? Well, for our social distance teaching and learning, um, you definitely need to have this continuity 
instructional continuity plan. Um, Elizabeth, did you want to add something? Yeah, I would like to jump in here and also we'd like to also link our workshops back to the mission of the university. And if you think, first of all, we have to have instruction and learning to reach the students to fulfill our mission. But I also think being uh, planning and preparing for disruptions, for disasters, showing students that we have thought through this, also really role models leadership skills and planning skills that students are, are going to need moving forward. And so I think having, being thoughtful about this, just like we're thoughtful about every aspect, every other aspect of our teaching, being thoughtful about this uh, can be really useful as well. All right. Thank you. We do have a workshop evaluation that I'd like you to fill out. I'm going to put the link to this also in the chat, but if you can scan the QR code, you can also get it there. Let me put this link to this in the chat. Um, and what we'd like to also know is how we can help you further. We've um, indicated uh, we, we started out with this um, workshop on instructional continuity planning, but how can we follow this up? You know, are there things that uh, that you would need to assist you with this um, instructional continuity planning? Perhaps if there's some bright space workshops or technology workshops or anything uh, related to that, if you can uh, indicate that information um, in this evaluation, that would help us as we're planning and going forward. Um, Elizabeth or Jay, do you have anything to add? Okay. Uh, um, no, I think I think any suggestions for how we can, as Jane has said, kind of uh, extend this discussion or focus in on something a little more specific, uh, we'd be glad to to look into and consider. And just remember. Uh, uh, the ice, the ice storms. Nobody expected to uh, miss class time last January. Yeah, and in the spring semester, we tend to like really get focused on this in fall, and that all happened in spring semester. All right, all right. And so, as we wait for you guys to fill out those evaluations, are there any other questions? Or Jay, was there something that came through in the chat that we didn't? Um, uh, we just got a note, just one last uh, one from Miriam. Uh, we should bring this up again towards the end of the academic year so faculty can work on their plan during the summer. Great idea. As a matter of fact, the very first time we did a workshop, we did do it um, at the end of the academic year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for that so reason. Yeah, for that reason. So uh, I will ask everybody now who's who's attended this today to be our advocates for this. I think that's a great time to do it because then people, I mean, right, the semester is going. What, what can we really do now except start to really think about this? Um, the problem is at the end of the academic year, people aren't feeling the pressure. And so, uh, the, so, so be our, when that comes through, because I think it's a great idea, be our advocates and uh, help people, encourage people to come. So think about it. Because like we said at the beginning, too, I think this is uh, helpful stuff to think about, regardless of whether the dis disruption happens, just being, being prepared in our classes in the shape they should be. All right. So are there Abba, any did other? You, Abba, did you get your question answered enough from before about the cheating? I can't find this way up there. Cheating and the discouraging students to from copying assignments. She's it was still, way up. Yeah. She's still here. Oh, she might have. She might. I know some people at one o'clock class. I think she's gone. So we'll grab her else time. Okay. Because I yeah. I okay. How do we avoid and make sure students do not cheat on assignments? Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, I think she's already gone, so I, I don't know. Yeah, but for the good of the group? Yeah. Or for the recording? I think a lot of that is is a lot of us who use Brightspace a lot now. It's, uh, um, it's something we consider, um, and there's, there's options out there. Um, you know, for papers, there's Turnitin. 
um, Tapa still is, is here, it looks like. Um, for quizzes and tests, you know, we've got uh, uh, Respondus Lockdown Browser, um, which we've, we've provided a lot of resources for and can continue to do that as well. Uh, I think Respondus been, Monitor, yeah. Monitor, yes, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it depends on the kind of thing you're having students do. Uh, and I think also too, and Elizabeth mentioned this once before, um, in the formatting of your um, assessment. So if you format it like a, it's a take home test or something, a take home, uh, if I'm explaining that correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So anything else that uh, we missed in the chat? Thank you, Elizabeth. Is there any other options other than going to the library? Hmm. So if you were somewhere um, and you didn't have internet access, like you said, I think you mentioned a coffee shop, McDonald's, Starbucks, fast food, somewhere. All right, so if that is, if there are no more questions, I can go ahead and stop the recording. All right.